Okay, today we're going to be going over geologic time. How do we know when things happened in Earth's past? How do we read the rocks and, and interpret what they're telling us? And for a geologist, we have um, a time scale. This is a uh, kind of cartoony way of looking at the geologic time scale, where way back here is 4.6 billion years ago when Earth began. And as we move our way upwards, that's basically where we're getting to today. And you'll notice that there are all these different names to different time periods. And that's because geologists are just like historians, right? Historians have names like the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, to describe these very distinctive periods in human history, while geologists have names like Permian, Mississippian, Devonian, that describe very distinctive periods of time in geologic history. Now, all of these different uh, names, um, there's, there's meanings behind them. They weren't just randomly assigned. And in many cases, the names come from places on Earth. Some of those are obvious. You'll see Pennsylvanian and Mississippian. Those are two different U.S. states. But you'll also see things like Cambrian. Well, Cambria was the old Roman name for the Kingdom of Wales. And how does the Cambrian time period get its name? Well, some of the first real in-depth scientific studies of rocks from that time period were conducted in Wales. And so that time period now gets called the Cambrian. And there are very, very distinctive rocks in Pennsylvania from the Pennsylvanian. And so that's how it got its name. So there are real reasons why we have that. Now, one other thing I wanted, well, actually two other things I want to point out about this. You will see that there are different colors. And in fact, um, for geologists, when they make geologic maps, maps of different rocks, um, we represent rocks from different ages on the map by color. So once you get used to that, you can start seeing things like, oh, green. Green is the age of the dinosaurs. So if I'm looking at a geologic map and I see a whole bunch of green on it, I'll be like, hey, rocks from the age of the dinosaurs. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to point out is here we have actual numbers, like when these different time periods um, occurred. And originally, people didn't have those numbers. Originally, they just kind of separated out the time periods by uh, distinctive rock types or events. But uh, later on, when people discovered radioactivity and uh, figured out that they could use it to figure out um, numerical ages, then those ages were added to the time scale. So what we're going to go over in lecture today is uh, how do we know when different events happen? How do we read the rocks? What kinds of different principles do we use and uh, to develop this time scale and in fact just go out in nature and see what happened and when it happened on Earth. And that's one of the beautiful things about being a geologist is you can look at some landscape like this. This is the Dolores River in Colorado. I've uh, rafted it a couple of times. And um, you can see there's these different layers in there. And for a geologist, they end up learning how to read those layers like you would read pages in a book. And I could end up saying, oh, this shows me that there is a river in this location at one time. And that shows me that there are sand dunes here and there is a vast desert here at one time. And that's one of the things I love about being a geologist is I don't just see the landscape, but I can, I can understand and read what it is telling me about Earth's epic past. All right, so let's talk about some personalities in, um, in geology because, of course, it's not like one day someone woke up and we just understood how to read geologic time. Uh, just like plate tectonics took the activities of many different scientists working on things to ultimately understand how Earth worked through plate tectonics, it also took many people, many different people studying to really understand how to read geologic history. And one of those people is James Hutton. 
James Hutton was a Scotsman. Uh, you can see he lived from 1726 to 1797. He was part of um, the Scottish Enlightenment, a group of scientists and great thinkers who were kind of centered around Edinburgh. And what Hutton did was he had two big contributions to the science of geology. He developed a concept that we call deep time. He was one of the early folks who recognized that Earth is really, really old. That's what deep time means. And he also developed a principle called uniformitarianism. We're going to take a look at both of these principles that uh, Hutton developed. And he was kind of an interesting guy because um, he was trained in various different professions, but he, uh, he didn't like them. And um, he was lucky because he was rich. And what he really liked to do is just sort of wander the Scottish countryside. And since he was rich, he didn't have to have a profession. He could wander his estate in the countryside in Scotland and look at the rocks and, and try to understand what they, uh, what they said to him. Uh, so let's look at deep time. Um, so this is an exhibit trying to summarize the age of the Earth, or visually summarize the age of the Earth, uh, up at the Johnson Geo Center in um, uh, St. John's, Newfoundland. And um, what we have here, we have these glass cases filled with sand. And this one is filled with something like um, 80 sand grains or 75 sand grains. Uh, which is kind of the average human lifespan. Um, this one is something like uh, 12,000 um, grains of sand, which is uh, since ice covered that part of Newfoundland in the Ice Age. This is 65 million grains of sand, which goes back to when the dinosaurs died out. I wonder who counted those. That's what grad students are for, right? You make them count. Okay, no, they're averaging it. Uh, and this one that goes all the way into the rafters of the, um, of the museum there is four and a half billion grains of sand, each grain of sand representing a year of Earth's history. And I should just tell you how vast and how long um, of a, a history our, our wonderful planet has. So that's deep time. Now, one of the places where Hutton had this vision that Earth was old was here at Sikar Point, which is in the lowlands of Scotland. And uh, this is uh, oftentimes called the birthplace of modern geology. Because what um, Hutton did is he went there with some of his other uh, scientific-minded friends and he showed them the rocks that were there. Do you see how we have these rocks right here that are going straight up and down and then we have these rocks here? Well, Hutton envisioned that these rocks were originally flat and they got tilted to the vertical position and eroded, and then newer rocks were dropped off on top of that. But he started thinking, that's going to take time to do. I, we can observe slow changes on Earth, but they, the rocks don't suddenly get tilted upwards or things like that. And so this is the place where he's like, the only way he could envision that happening was by slow, steady changes over these billions of years of Earth history. And uh, so that's um, um, Sikar Point, where um, Hutton really kind of had these ideas of deep time. Now, the other important principle Hutton developed was uniformitarianism. And this states that the physical laws and processes we observe today have also operated in the past. Um, and you can say this in a succinct manner, the present is the key to the past. So he's not saying that Earth doesn't change, right? Sea level rises, it falls, mountains are built, mountains are eroded. But what he is saying is the laws that govern the way the Earth works, those are what is unchanging. So it's kind of like I, I have this, this purple highlighter here. If I let it go, it's going to fall, right? It's going to drop because of, well, the law of gravity, right? If I did that yesterday, the same thing would happen. If I did it a million years ago, the same thing would happen. Um, so that's one of those unchanging laws. The Earth itself 
where the rivers flow and what the surface of the earth looks like, but the rules, the natural laws that govern its behavior are unchanging. That's uniformitarianism. Now, what does that mean for us in geology? Well, that means we can observe the way the earth works today and then use it to interpret the past. For example, right here, you can see my husband's feet, and hopefully you can also see those little ripple marks under the water there. Well, we can then observe how ripple marks work today. We can see them forming. And then if we see them preserved in rocks, we can be like, aha, I know how those form today, so I know how they formed in the past. And that's really how uniformitarianism works. We use what we know about the, the laws of nature that we can observe today and interpret them in the ancient rock record. All right, another principle that I need to uh, introduce you guys to is the concept of a formation. You will hear geologists talk about rock formations. Well, a formation is a large body of rock that's easily distinguished from adjacent rock units, and it uh, covers a large area. So for example, you see that kind of tan colored um, uh, rock unit, that layer right there? That's a formation, right? It's distinctively different from the rocks below it and above it. And in fact, you can trace that uh, rock formation. It covers much of Utah, parts of Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona. It even goes into Nevada. Um, so that's where it, it covers a large area. And that's called the Navajo Sandstone. And, and so all rock formations get names. And the reason they get names is so geologists can easily talk about them. And it's so much easier for me to say, I was looking at the Navajo sandstone in Colorado than I was looking at this tan rock formation that's Jurassic aged, has big cross beds in it, and covers a bunch of states in the West, right? It's much easier to say Navajo sandstone, and all other geologists will know what I'm talking about. Um, how do they get their names? Well, sandstone obviously is the composition, right? And Navajo refers to the Navajo Nation. And one of the best places in the world to go and see that rock formation is on the Navajo Nation. So it is uh, um, called the Navajo Sandstone. There's also the Chinle Formation there. Well, it's called a formation because it's a mix of sandstone and uh, mudstone. So it doesn't get a distinctive like rock type. We just say formation. And where does Chin Lee come from? It comes from a place, a town in Arizona. Uh, so that's how these formations get their names. And once you study geology and learn more about the rocks, you can start looking at all those individual formations and seeing um, how Earth has changed over time. All right, so let's talk about dating. How do we figure out when different events happen on our planet? Well, there's two main types of dating. One is called relative dating. You're only allowed to do this in certain states. Well, okay, maybe not. No, relative dating is actually putting things into an order of events. It's basically saying this happened first, this happened second, this happened third. We're not putting any, any like actual, this happened a million years ago. There's none of those numbers associated. It's just what, in what order did they happen? Now you can also do numerical dating, which some books are gonna call absolute dating. I prefer the term numerical dating because that explains exactly what we're doing. We're giving a number to when this thing happened. We're giving a number in, in years. So that's when I would say something like, the Navajo sandstone in uh, parts of New Mexico is uh, 160 million years old. I'm putting a number on it that's numerical dating. In reality, in geology, we often do both of these things. We kind of figure out what order things happened in, and if we're able to put numbers on there, we can add those numbers to it. So we're going to start then by looking at new, uh, relative dating and some of the, the ways we can figure out the order of events, and we'll finish up by looking at how we do numerical dating. 
Now, relative dating, the, uh, the first three principles of relative dating that we're going to talk about were developed by this guy named Nicholas Steno. You can see a picture of him there. And uh, he was from uh, Denmark, and his real name was Neil Stenson. But at the time that he worked, back in the 1600s, it was uh, customary for scientists and scholars to Latinize their names, right? Turn their name into sounding like it was a Latin name. And so he took Neil Stenson and uh, became Nicholas Steno. And uh, he was an interesting guy because he couldn't really figure out what he wanted to be when he grew up. He was uh, originally trained to be a physician, to be a doctor, and he was actually very good at that. In fact, so I think it's in your salivary glands, there's some like structure that he discovered that's still called like Stenson structure. Uh, but anyway, he was a very good physician and became the court physician to the Grand Duke of Tuscany, which is part of Italy. And uh, while he was there, he wandered the Italian countryside and observed the rocks and minerals there. And he came up during that time with several geologic principles. And after he was done working in Tuscany, he decided that he wanted um, uh, to become a priest. And so he was ordained and eventually became a Catholic bishop. And in fact, he, um, the Catholic Church even because of all of the, he was very good at being a bishop as well, and because of everything that he'd done, the Catholic Church beatified him, which is like uh, one step under sainthood. So he's um, it's a very interesting man who had a very interesting career. But what we want to look at is what were his contributions to figuring out geologic time. All right, so these are Steno's principles of relative dating, and they apply to sedimentary rocks and extrusive igneous rocks. So this means they only apply to rocks that form here on Earth's surface. Now the first of these principles is the principle of superposition. And this states that in an undisturbed sequence, and undisturbed means we haven't had any like crazy earthquakes or mountain building or other kind of weird stuff happen, but in an undisturbed sequence of rocks, the layers of rocks become progressively younger from the bottom to the top. So the stuff at the bottom is going to be the oldest and it's going to get younger and younger and younger working our way upwards. And that's just what we see here. This is Dead Horse Point in Utah. So way down here, these are going to be the oldest rocks. And as we work our way upwards, the rocks are going to get progressively younger. And that's Steno's first principle, the principle of superposition. Now the next principle is original horizontality. This is that sedimentary rock layers originally are deposited horizontally and uh, that means if you find them tilted or some bent or something like that, like what we saw at Sikar Point, something happened after they formed. Right? That's how we can figure out this like before and after, right? So they're horizontal, like what we see at Dead Horse Point. Nothing's really happened to these rocks since they were deposited. If we see something like this, right, up in Svalbard, these are sedimentary rocks. They are not horizontal. Right? Look at how these things are bent and folded. That tells us some forces acted on those rocks after they were formed. All right, Steno's last principle is the principle of lateral continuity. And this principle states that layers of rock originally extend in all directions, and then they get thinner and thinner and thinner and thin to nothing, or what geologists sometimes say, they pinch out. So that's what we're seeing right here, right? See this rock unit here gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and then finally disappears. If a rock unit just abruptly stops, right, it doesn't get thinner and thinner, it just ends, that tells us something happened to it after it formed. Some kind of erosion or faulting or something affected that rock after formation. So those are Steno's three principles of relative dating. And uh, the next guy we're going to take a look at in volume two is Charles Lyell.